grave sites. Um, one is E.M. Escobar. Uh, at the present time, I'm researching uh, anything I can possibly find about this particular person, whether it was a, a male or a female and their age. But if, if there's no marker for date or anything else. But eventually, we hope to find out just exactly who that person was. And, uh, and then we can add some uh, more uh, detail as far as the, uh, the identity of the remains that are in this grave site. But over in this grave site here, we have a family called Conflaglia. And again, we have a case of, of, of a child that didn't live much beyond its one year age. And uh, they are scattered all through the cemetery and much more frequently among the Chumash because of the, uh, uh, the harshness of this particular area during and before the mission period. Now, as we move over towards the uh, northwest buttress of the mission church, uh, we have a perfect example of what we have been able to do in researching the grave sites. And these two grave sites, uh, well, we, we had a wooden marker here, uh, and by doing some work on the uh, original painting that had been done of the name on there, we were able to discover uh, who, whose grave site this was. And we discovered that it was the grave site of, of the Beerband family. And as it turns out, this family, uh, as I understand it, we haven't been able to go much beyond that. Uh, members of this family are still living here in the valley. And uh, there is a ranch called the Beerabent uh, Ranch here in the valley. And we hope uh, in the near future to contact these people and know if perhaps uh, uh, they were grandparents or great grandparents of, of members of that family. But one is the gravesite of Juan Beerabent. Uh, he, he, was, he died in 1909 and Maria, his wife, in 1916. And uh, the, we were able to determine the dates of death and the, 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 the male and female name here by being able to determine what the last name was going into the, into the death records. And we found these two grave sites. And um, you're marked here, the hedge was planted evidently by the family and, um, uh, to mark the grave site. We have now entered the original early Chumash section of the Mission Cemetery. And it is in this area that we said before that there were approximately uh, 1,200 burial sites. A great number of them, as I said again, uh, were children. Um, in this particular site, we're not sure whether this was a Chumash uh, uh, related family or not, but this was a teenager who died at the age of, of 16 years old. As we move over this way, we do have an identified uh, grave, which is the grave site of Rosa Cota. And uh, this grave site has been restored. The cross was broken and the, and the name was almost entirely wiped out. We have been able to uh, uh, identify and put a new cross and a base around this statue. She's buried next to her husband. Um, uh, Rosa died in 1918. and. Um, her husband, Juan Cota, died in 1938. Uh, it is hard to understand how uh, uh, such a late burial, except that there must have been uh, an area here close to Rosa's site, because this is quite late for anyone to be buried in the uh, mission uh, part or Chumash section of the cemetery. Also coming over here, and some of these uh, uh, markers could have been put on by second and third generation uh, Chumash, who families knew where their grandparents or parents were buried. Another uh, site we have here, a small marker, again, is a baby. Uh, this, is, again, also is a, a small marker, which generally identifies it to be in the site of a baby. In this particular case, the family planted a little hedge around the grave uh, in order to uh, identify the site. As we move down through the cemetery, uh, we are going to, and we will come back and discuss this large cross here in, in a few moments. Into this area here is uh, definitely the Chumash section. Uh, uh, we have older pictures with a great many more uh, wooden crosses. The area was rather depleted, but uh, so many of the crosses somewhere along the way, be, being they were made of wood, have just uh, disappeared. 
But as I said, there are probably around 1,200 uh, tomb ash buried in this uh, particular area. Uh, the crosses that are marked here are almost all new, dating to 1980, when the men's club had a project of coming in and uh, uh, what crosses were here were re remade and re uh, using the same design and were replaced on the same site that they were taken from. And uh, that, for that reason, we do have a great many crosses uh, that uh, are uh, uh, still marking the place of the... Um, of the burial sites. I'm, I'm standing now in front of a, a, another marker which is associated with the marker we spoke of before. Uh, we were speaking before about the grave site uh, where there was only a headstone at the far end of the cemetery. This is also a member of that same family, a Senora Guadalupe Alvarez, and she was the uh, daughter of the lady that's buried at the far end of the cemetery. and. Um, her family still comes and visits both this grave site and the, the, the great grave site of the great-grandmother, which we uh, saw before. So it, uh, there are a number of graves in here where families do remember uh, the, the site of their uh, 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 family burials, and we hope to, over the next few years to be able to make contact with these people and perhaps identify more of the grave sites that are here uh, in, the, in the cemetery. As we pass by this area, we can look up towards the window in the church. This is the, um, it was at this particular point in the church that there was a doorway which uh, provided an entrance into the cemetery from the church. It is presently on the inside is a grotto, we will see it later, which is a grotto dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary. This uh, section of the church was walled up after the uh, uh, severe rains in 1910 by Father Buckler. It was uh, uh, in that particular uh, year this uh, portion of the uh, uh, church wall received heavy rains. There were no rain gutters as you see now and we spoke of that earlier. Uh, Father uh, Buckler did put rain gutters on the church primarily because we saw the damage that could be done to these adobe buildings. So uh, uh, this arch right here and the doorway here, the walls uh, began to, uh, to melt uh, with the uh, great quantity of water that was falling. And uh, after the storm was over, uh, in, order, in, in part of restoring this wall uh, and, and making it a little bit more safe, Father Buckler had the wall sealed up and this buttress was uh, repaired and, and, uh, uh, and you can see some of the uh, spot on it where it was damaged, but it was plastered up and, uh, and in, in, that, in that case preserved. But one of the things that Father Buckler did was to pour this concrete slab that you see here uh, along the side of the mission. That way, uh, uh, much of the water that um, uh, comes off of the church uh, and the moisture here from sprinklers is kept away from the walls of the church. As we move up into this direction here, we're going to find uh, a, a couple of interesting uh, things to explain. The first of these is the bell tower. Uh, in that great storm in, in 1910, uh, this bell tower, the bell tower of the old mission, uh, collapsed totally and uh, uh, became a ruin. And uh, when the rainstorm was over, Father Buckler uh, decided that the bell tower had to be rebuilt. And so uh, he got a man named George McManus uh, from Santa Barbara, who was a contractor, and he gave the contract to him to rebuild uh, the bell tower. Uh, in the process of, uh, and time of rebuilding of the bell tower, Father Buckler uh, took a trip back to Bavaria, which was his hometown. And while the, uh, uh, while the bell tower was being built, uh, the contractor had a, a, a mistaken idea of the appearance of the uh, bell tower. And as a result, when Father Buckler returned, he was quite shocked to see that the bell tower was not quite in the form of its original ap appearance. And of course, the, the project was done and there was nothing that he could do about it. However, in, uh, 19, in the 1950s, uh, late 50s, uh, the little 
uh, gangway that you can see up towards the top of the bell tower, that had rotted out. And old John, that we had talked about earlier, had gone up there one morning, and uh, he, as his usual uh, thing, two or three times a year, he would uh, go up into the top of the bell tower, and he would oil the uh, hinges of the bell, because at that particular time, the brothers that lived here rang the bells uh, twice a day, once at lunch and once at 6 o'clock in the evening for the Angelus. Well, as he crossed this little platform here, it collapsed underneath, and he fell to the ground here and broke his hip. And naturally, uh, in, in a situation like that, after something like that happens, an inspection is made, and it was found that uh, all that area in there, and including the uh, balcony in the church, or the choir loft in the church, were in very bad shape so that they were unsafe to be used by, uh, by people. And uh, as a result, uh, at that time, the uh, choir loft had to be rebuilt, and uh, uh, this little gangway also had to be restored. But as part and parcel of doing that, this was the time when, when Father Tim uh, decided it was able, he was able to restore the, um, uh, the bell tower to its original appearance. The bell tower that Mr. McManus had uh, uh, built uh, had the same general form as the bell tower that we see here today, except as we look to the bell tower, we'll see the well in the top and two uh, bell wells along the side. But the bell tower that Mr. McManus built had also a bell well in where you see the little cabinet door. And, uh, uh, and that is, of course, what made it, uh, uh, took away its originality. So uh, it was at that time that the, uh, the well was, um, was filled in and uh, the bell tower took on its original appearance. However, at that time, it was also decided that the bell tower, uh, being as narrow as it was, was not very safe. So we're going to go up very close to it and, and see now uh, that the major change that was made in the bell tower under Father Tim's period, uh, pastorate here in the 50s. Uh, one might question why all of a sudden there appears a very special and different kind of a cross as a, as a grave marker. Actually, this uh, cross does not mark the grave, a particular grave site of any particular person. But the interesting story about this uh, cement cross is that it belongs on the top of the bell tower. And I came in here one morning in, in the early 1970s, and I, as I walked through the seminary check, cemetery checking the walls, all of a sudden I noticed this uh, cross laying on the ground below the bell tower. And as I looked up, I saw, I saw that the uh, canopy over the bell tower was, was somewhat uh, destroyed in the middle. I looked up further, and the cross at the top of the uh, bell tower was missing. Well, it is in such a bad shape, there was no way to ever get it back up there in a safe uh, uh, way. So uh, it was decided uh, to, uh, to set this cross uh, by this pillar. It doesn't mark anyone's particular grave, but to set it there as a preservative, as to be preserved, because it is part of the bell tower that uh, uh, Father Buckler built under the uh, workmanship of uh, Mr. George McManus. Uh, and then after having placed this cross uh, in this particular place, uh, Chris Klebo, a local blacksmith, came in and uh, uh, made a metal crucifix cross for the top of the bell tower. And uh, that is well uh, put into the uh, concrete of the tower and is in a, of a much safer uh, nature. <clears throat> what had happened is just the concrete had weakened on this uh, cross and uh, uh, just all of a sudden uh, uh, it, it was uh, no way longer able to support itself and it fell to the ground. Fortunately, it did not break. A small chip was taken out of the corner here, but the rest of it stayed intact, so we're very fortunate to preserve it. Having placed it here, and a few years later, around 1976, there was a gentleman here named John Slavin. He was a member of the men's club, and his, uh, uh, he lived in, uh, near the airport in San Inez. He was a fairly wealthy man, and he did, uh, mach did specialty machinist work for the U.S. Navy. 
And uh, it was quite well off. Well, in, um, in that particular time, if you will recall, a number of young people were being, uh, as it were, seduced by these various uh, uh, um, religious leaders and uh, people who did a lot of brainwashing. Well, one of his daughters got involved with one of these groups and disappeared. And he found her in one of these communes and she had been totally brainwashed. Well, he was able to get her out of the commune and he spent his entire fortune, including the value of his house and everything, trying to get her brain back uh, to normal, which uh, actually uh, turned out to be very unsuccessful. <clears throat> the result was that the poor man died as a pauper and he did not even o o own a, a piece of, of ground to be buried in. And so Father Roger, uh, his wife came and said, you know, we are in dire straits and, and uh, uh, we don't even or can't even afford to, to find a place to bury John. So Father Roger said, well, we'll bury him here in the cemetery. So he asked me to find a place. I thought the proper place would be next to this cross. And right at the base of this cross are the ashes of uh, John Slavin, recorded in the uh, archives of the mission uh, as a burial site out of the uh, Indian period or Chumash period of the mission. The bell tower that we're looking at the present time is twice as thick as the uh, bell tower that Father Buckler rebuilt, and it is also twice as thick as the original bell tower, which fell down in, 19, uh, in the rains of 1910. Uh, the bell tower that was restored here was about right in here, and it was hollow on the inside. Uh, Father had a stairway uh, built on the inside so that we could go into the bell tower, go up to the top, and ring the bells uh, from the inside of the bell tower. However, after the damage was done to this bell tower, and uh, uh, it was left this way until Father Tim came. At that particular time, a number of things, as we said, had to be done to the bell tower because of the weakness of the catwalks and, and the choir loft. And it was at that time, it was also determined that the bell tower, uh, being of such a nature that it was so uh, narrow, was not seismically safe. And so it was widened to, a, uh, to about twice the particular size. And you can still actually go inside the bell tower, but the entrance to the inside is a little bit different. And we'll take a look at that in just a couple of minutes. This time, at the time when it was uh, uh, determined that the choir loft was unsafe, and it had to be restored, and also the, uh, the connection with the church was also unsafe. It was also decided because of the narrowness of the bell tower to, uh, uh, to make it twice as wide. And consequently, uh, a section from about here to the end of the wall was added. It is also hollow on the inside, but it is steel reinforced, and it is, uh, makes this bell tower much more safe than it would be had it been such a narrow uh, structure. Looking up a little bit towards the uh, center between the top of the bell tower and the ground level here, uh, about where that, just a little bit above where that little window is, uh, there was also a, uh, another well for a bell uh, to be, uh, that hung within that, uh, that opening. And uh, that, uh, the reason there were so, no, there were so many different Bell Wells, it was enabled Father Buckler at the same time, even though he didn't like the, what was, was happening here, it also allowed him to hang uh, the, the Parisima Bells that we ha had obtained uh, in order to protect them because of uh, the rapid decay in the state of uh, uh, condition of uh, La Parisima Mission in Lampo. We're now going to move over a little bit to the side and we'll start paying attention a little bit to the other corner of the bell tower and to some of the grave sites and also the cross which is located in the center of the cemetery. Okay, we are now on the other side of the bell tower and this gives us a little better idea of the widening of the bell tower during Father Tim's time. Uh, this wall was, uh, this is the exterior wall of the bell tower. Uh, it, although it was hollow, it was steel reinforced as I said. Uh, there was also left a doorway so that uh, you could get into the bell tower and also the stairway could be used at that time if someone wished. However, it was determined it was just easier to drop ropes down through the bell tower and the ropes for the various bells hung within this area here. 
And during the time when I first came here, the bells were rung, and I did them quite often myself. At Christmas time and Easter, we would come here together with a little help, sometimes my sons, and we would ring the bells, for example, the Gloria on uh, Holy Saturday and on Holy Thursday. Uh, adjacent to the bell tower are the grave sites of uh, five Capuchin brothers and priests who served here at the mission during the er early periods. Uh, the one grave site here, which is, uh, which is marked as Father Albert Bibby, is the grave site of the very first pastor of Mission San Inez uh, at, when it was taken over by the Capuchin priests in, in 1924. Unfortunately, Father Albert was only able to serve here at the mission less than a year when he became very seriously ill and died in Santa Barbara uh, within the year after he was assigned at the mission. There is a long and very uh, interesting story about Father Bibby. He is actually an Irish patriot uh, who uh, was a confessor to the IRA during the early revolutionary days in Ireland and was uh, uh, captured by the British and uh, uh, they tried to force him to reveal what the, the different IRA members had uh, said in confession about the, uh, their activities as revolutionaries. Of course, Father Bibby could not break the seal of confession, and as a result, after having been arrested, he was banished from Ireland and uh, came to the United States, where he was taken in by the uh, Capuchin Fathers in Rhode Island. And from there, he uh, was assigned here to Old Mission San Inez. Uh, his health was poor, and he died a very short time later. As you can see, he was uh, uh, just a little bit under uh, 50 years old when he passed away. Uh, he was uh, recognized, uh, long recognized as a, an, an Irish hero, and as a result, in 1956, uh, uh, the Irish uh, government requested, uh, the southern Irish government requested that his body be returned to Ireland so that it could be properly um, uh, recognized. And his, he was disinterred at that particular time. Uh, we have some pictures in the archives of this casket, which was a steel casket being removed from the ground. and. Uh, we also have pictures of his arrival in Dublin and the huge crowds and celebration and procession that took place in his honor. As a result, this gravesite is empty. We do retain the monument and the, and the marker to his memory. Uh, and next to him are some of the other brothers and priests that served here at the mission. Uh, the gravesite here is uh, for brother, brother Brendan Green, who saved, served here at the mission until about 1964. He left and was served in, in Oregon and uh, died up there two years later. His body was interred here uh, uh, next to the mission. He was a very old gentleman and quite a, a man in his own right. Next to him is the, uh, next to, uh, brother, to Father Albert, is the gravesite of Brother Pascal uh, Cantwell, who was not actually a Capuchin brother, but he was a member of the Third Order, had dedicated life to the service of the Capuchins, and um, uh, served here at the mission uh, for a short period of time previous to 1935. Uh, next to him is the gravesite of Sebast Father Sebastian Brendan. Uh, he uh, was buried here in about 1937. He served at the mission here for a very short period of time and was in interred here at the mission. And the last gravesite is that of Father Isidore Kennedy, who um, uh, actually uh, was buried here in the time that I served at the mission. His grave was dug here by by Tony Chavez, and it was unfortunately in this area when the grave was being dug, we did come across the remains of, of two young uh, Chumash uh, neophytes whose graves were there. So with due respect, to their, their bones were interred, disinterred, and uh, were reburied and set in their original places uh, above the casket of Father Isidore. As we look down along the buttresses, the huge buttresses that uh, uh, protect the walls and strengthen the walls of, of the north side of the mission church. Uh, we'll come across the large concrete 
a crucifix that is in the center of the cemetery, which in, in, over the years naturally was built in, a, in an upright condition, but it has uh, settled somewhat over the years so that it now is, is somewhat out of, out of uh, a level. Uh, if, if you ask yourself where and why the reason for this crucifix or cross, it is, and it is a Celtic cross, as you will notice, because of the uh, designs on the, um, the uh, ends of the, um, uh, of the cross, uh, the only reason that that cross is there is uh, by, uh, by reason of the fact that when the rebuilding took place here of the bell tower and the walls were re-strengthened along here and all this concrete was poured along here to protect the mission from the water, there was a large amount of concrete that had been brought up here uh, by uh, uh, the Mr. McManus in order to do the work here at the mission and he wanted to take it back uh, to Santa Barbara with him, but it would have been so expensive, so he gave it. He told Father uh, to keep it. Well, then Father turned around and uh, made a new contract with uh, Mr. McManus, and uh, this cross was made from the remaining concrete that was used here. And uh, uh, it actually fills a purpose because every Catholic cemetery is required to have a cross as an identifying mark. So it does fulfill that uh, requirement. It also gives us uh, somewhat of an historical uh, touch to the uh, Chumash area of the mission. As you look down the, the uh, cemetery, you see it from a little bit different perspective. And as you look off into the distance, and we will walk down that way in a few moments, past the, uh, where we begin, began this uh, talk on the uh, cemetery, we will also take a look and uh, some of the expectations that we have so that this cemetery could be reopened at least uh, to uh, uh, take on the remains, take the remains of, of more people and from the new mission period of the present time. We are again at the far end, the far western end of the cemetery where we began our, uh, our view and our study of the uh, cemetery of Old Mission San Inez. And I am standing on an area which is actually, out, although it is walled in now uh, with the present wall, uh, was not part of the mission cemetery at any time. In fact, the, the area that I am now walking on uh, was uh, completely barren. There were no trees. There was no wall out here. And this was what we talked about yesterday was parking lot number one. And as a, as a result, as of uh, each year, the front meadow, which is on the outside of the wall, coming around this way and going all the way down to the post office, was under cultivation. It was generally uh, hay, barley, alfalfa, this particular type of thing was planted each year. So annually, the little fence that ran along here merely separated the grain field from the cemetery. In, uh, uh, with the coming of Father Cyril and the restoration of the cemetery wall, uh, the wall was extended down to tie in with the uh, parking lot wall for, lot, uh, for parking lot number one. It is this area that we have uh, great hopes that in the, within the coming year that this part of the cemetery might be, this part which is adjacent to the cemetery might be officially uh, added to the mission cemetery and then reopened again, this time for the burial uh, of, the, of cremated remains of uh, Catholics and members of the parish. So at the present time we are dealing with the archdiocese to find out what is necessary uh, in, in the line of, of approval from the archdiocese uh, to uh, open up this area of the cemetery. Uh, it, we do not have a complete design at this particular time, but we are hoping that there might be a wall which would contain the remains of a great number of uh, members of the parish, and also there might be some uh, uh, sites in the ground itself which would also become burial sites. But uh, one can see it's quite a large area. Uh, it, is, it is well planted, and with a little bit of design and work, I, I think we can have a very beautiful uh, uh, cremation cemetery here at the Old Mission, and we'll uh, more or less bring us into the modern period as far as the cemetery is concerned.
Uh, we are still in the uh, the additional cemetery area, and if you'll notice, there is a very nice alcove in this area, which will make a perhaps a ni very nice place for a, a wall uh, in which the crema cremation remains can be stored. Uh, you will look in there and see that there are some olive trees running along here. They look quite old, but they are not, in reality, uh, not very old. They were planted uh, probably around 19... Uh, uh, 79, 1980, I planted them myself. They were only uh, little uh, small plants that stood no more than uh, about five foot high. Also, the uh, pepper trees that are in the background are, were part of Father Camillus's plan to outline the property uh, with pepper trees. And uh, uh, outside of the few pepper trees on the main road, uh, every tree, plant, and shrub I myself planted uh, here on the mission property starting in the early 60s and ending in, uh, in, 19, in the 1990s. But we are hoping that, uh, again, that this will turn into a, a beautiful cemetery area and be a, uh, a great addition to the old mission itself. We are now at the uh, back end of the church, and uh, we have already explained uh, the uh, the connection of this uh, of the church to the uh, lower part of the quadrangle. But I want to draw your attention to the door. This door enters into the sacristy, into the back of the church, and it appears to be a very short door. And uh, originally, it was not uh, it was not as short as it is. But there, the levels of between the outside and the inside in the sacristy were of a different level and as a result of the door itself uh, uh, appears to be short because it is not an original door. These doors most likely date to the work that Father Tim did during his or Father uh, Father Tim or Father Isidore, I'm not sure. Either one was responsible for some of these doors that were uh, made because of the deterioration of the original doors. Many of the latches that we see here were made by Chris Klebo in Buellton. He's now deceased, but he made these latches um, uh, in imitation or as close as imitation we could come to what the original blacksmiths may have done here at the mission of uh, the Chumash blacksmiths would have done. And the same goes uh, for the hinges, which you will notice have a very old appearance. And uh, much of this work is like the work that was done at uh, Carmel Mission. Uh, and most of their uh, metal work uh, was totally gone and was uh, restored based on, uh, in modern times, based on what the originals probably looked like. Standing now at the uh, rear of the church on the garden side, uh, the, do the door that we're looking at, at, the, at, uh, at right now is the entrance into the uh, sacristy. Uh, this door is, is again, is, is not of any great historical value. It was, uh, uh, Mamie Goulet talks about this door being made from old parking, park packing wood that they got from the carpenter in uh, Goleta. And so uh, th it is an, uh, an old door, but it is not of the mission period. But what is, is of great importance is the fact is the, uh, uh, as it were, out of place buttress that exists here along the building and stretching to the ceiling. In 1974, when the engineers made their safety study of the mission, they found that this area of the church was extremely weak. And as a result, it was necessary to put a, a buttress here and on the other side of the, uh, uh, of the church, also a buttress which is identical to it, uh, and to uh, pull, put turn, huge turnbuckles, which we will see later in the sacristy, put huge turnbuckles anchored into these buttresses to pull the walls because the walls were beginning to separate and pull apart at the, uh, where they joined the, the sacristy walls, joined the, sac the sanctuary walls, and it was necessary to uh, put in these huge um, uh, buttresses and turnbuckles. And we'll see some very interesting things about those turnbuckles uh, and the difficult time that they had when we got our chance to take a look at the sacristy. But we're right now, we're now going to go into the church and uh, uh, I believe the best way to, uh, to get a good view of the church is to take the first shots of the church from the choir loft and uh, then we can isolate or we can zero in on the different aspects of the church.
In association with the new strengthening buttress that was uh, placed along here in 1974, you will also notice the uh, outcropping of concrete uh, between the various buttresses. All the way down this south side of the church, uh, there is this protrusion, and that is a, a concrete um, footing that was put in along the uh, um, original mission walls at the same time the buttress was, 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 re, was built. And it, the, the same purpose here was used as it was in the cemetery, but the engineers determined that it did not have to be quite as wide as, as Father Buckler did in the cemetery. But uh, these, uh, this concrete uh, uh, protrusion from the buildings goes down about three foot into the ground. And the idea there is that any moisture that would come and affect these walls it would not penetrate beyond that and do any damage uh, to the church uh, wall itself. I'm standing here in front of the mission below the uh, original uh, mission bells, which were established by the uh, uh, the uh, native daughters of uh, California. Uh, most likely, this bell was uh, donated to the mission around uh, 1906 and has stayed in this place ever since. The only thing that has been removed and uh, stolen from here was a, so a short, small directional sign which pointed to Santa Barbara and told how many miles it was to uh, Mission Santa Barbara and another arrow which pointed to La Parisima telling how many miles it was from this mission to uh, uh, La Parisima. Uh, recently here in California, uh, 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 the state has sponsored the establishment of a, about every mile along the Camino Real, uh, the establishment of a new set of bells to replace the ones that over the years have been stolen. Fortunately, we have been able to preserve this bell uh, and as it was donated by the, uh, uh, the daughters of California. To my left, you will notice the bell tower and the, the three bell wells, which are uh, at the present time uh, in this bell tower. Uh, this is a replica of the original bell tower. Uh, it fell down, the, the first bell tower fell down in the rains of, um, in, in 1910 and uh, was replaced at that time. However, it was replaced mistakenly, and instead of having the four, uh, three wells, uh, a fourth well was added between the two side wells uh, in the bell tower. Uh, this was corrected in, uh, in uh, 1955, and uh, the bell tower was uh, restored uh, to its original look. Well, uh, to my right, we look at the face, the opening of the Mission Church. Uh, the face of the church itself, and we look at the giant oak doors of the mission, which are not the original doors, but were donated by the owner of the Santa Maria Inn in about 1912. Uh, and uh, it was a great donation because the original doors of oak had pretty well de deteriorated, especially because uh, they are uh, ex face the sun, they face the weather, all the storms beat against this end of the church and the hottest the sun uh, comes against this door. So, but now we have an ongoing project to, to keep these doors, doors oiled and preserved at least once a year with linseed oil and some other kind of preservative. Also, uh, looking at, towards the mission door, uh, you will see the large um, patio or uh, plaza in front of the uh, mission. Uh, this was um, built for the mission uh, during the uh, uh, pastorate of Father Cyril, which would have put it in the 1980s. It is uh, not a replica of anything that is original here at the mission, but it was found to be necessary in order to accommodate the large number of people entering uh, the church and leaving the church after the masses. Uh, before uh, before 1980, there was a simple asphalt walk about six foot wide, which uh, led directly to the door of the mission, and on uh, both sides uh, where the plants are now, they extended over further. It was also at that time the Italian cypress were planted here. The intent of the Italian cypress was that they would be allowed to grow for about uh, 10 years, and then they would be cut down and, and uh, 
uh, renewed. Uh, however, one way or another, these trees have not been uh, changed and, uh, and trimmed down, and as a consequence, they perhaps are getting a little bit too big for the plaza. It is our intention to replace this plaza uh, within the next few months, so that perhaps by the first of the year 2007, uh, we will have a new plaza here at the entrance to the church with the possibility that they will also be dressed up with a small fountain. Now, as we look to my right, we will be looking at the convento of the uh, mission. The uh, first uh, nine, ten arches of this building are original arches dating back to uh, the building of the mission starting in 1804. Uh, the second story that you see on the mission uh, was rebuilt in 1947 uh, after the earthquake of 1812. Uh, 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 it was so severe that the second floor of the mission uh, collapsed. And uh, the Padres realized that this being earthquake uh, territory, that it was not feasible to have two-story buildings. So when they uh, rebuilt the church, which, which is a two-story building itself, but consists of walls that are over six uh, feet thick. Uh, it was decided not to put the roof back on the uh, uh, on the second floor, and uh, the first floor was capped over. And you know, all the early pictures up until 1947 will show this mission without a second floor. Uh, after the uh, first uh, nine or ten arches, uh, uh, the ruins of the mission were left and uh, gradually melted and uh, uh, decayed. And it wasn't until uh, 19, the late 1980s that uh, uh, through uh, funds that were raised for restoration that we were able to restore uh, this far uh, southern section of the convento. This is looking at the, uh, towards the south, under the uh, arches of the convento. Uh, the beams that you see in the ceiling and the lights are not original one. They were part of the restoration of putting the second floor back on the mission in 1947. But uh, the view that we have now looking down through the uh, 20 arches that are here uh, gives us a good idea of what uh, the mission looked like at its completion date in 1822. All 21 of the missions uh, in 1996 were uh, bestowed the gift of a statue of uh, Saint, uh, or rather, yes, Saint Juniper Sarah. Uh, they were don donated by a man called Eugene Hannon, and uh, each mission got a statue identical. Uh, he uh, also determined where he wanted them to be put at the mission, but uh, does make a, uh, a great uh, asset here to the mission at the opening of the plaza. What we're looking at right now is most likely a original uh, doorbell for the mission which would have called the attention of the Padres that they had a visitor or that someone wanted to see uh, the Padres. Uh, the construction of it and the material leads us to believe that it's an original uh, bell, but we do not have any reference to it in the historical books. But stepping forward into the future a little bit, in, until the 1950s, because the parish was growing, uh, Father Tim found it necessary to install some real doorbells, and uh, one of these doorbells rang on the lower floor at the office, the other rang upstairs, so uh, the priest was accessible at times when the gift shop was closed. Now, uh, turning to our right, we will see a, a bench, uh, which was uh, not his necessarily historical, but part of the work of one of the bro brothers that was here for a number of years, and he was a great carpenter, his name was Brother Alexis, and he built uh, a number of these little benches. He also bent, built some pews in the church and uh, some kneelers also, which we probably will get a chance to see uh, uh, later on when we go through the museum. Now passing over to the left, we will see what looks like to be a very old and uh, decrepit pew. And that is exactly what it is. It uh, is a pew that was or used in the church between uh, probably a 1910 and up to about 1974, at which time uh, uh, more pews were added to the church. There were about 
20 of these pews, they were removed and uh, uh, they were sold as souvenirs uh, uh, to the um, different parishioners, but they do not have any historical value. They most likely were built uh, down at Gaviota. There was a cabinet shot down there, and probably Father Buckler had them built around uh, probably 1910. These pews are of a different style, and again, they uh, do not have any historical value as far as the uh, uh, early period of the mission is concerned. However, uh, their history uh, is somewhat interesting. Uh, during the, uh, the time that uh, Cardinal McIntyre was the Archbishop of Los Angeles, he had a small home down on Fremont Place off of Wilshire Boulevard, and in that home he had a small chapel. Sometime during uh, his, the time that he lived there, uh, the, the chapel was remodeled. And uh, at that time, uh, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart were just getting established here in California, and they were great friends with uh, Cardinal McIntyre. And the chapel that we had here at our convent uh, was uh, uh, very poorly laid out. And uh, they went to the uh, cardinal and <coughs> asked him if they might have the pews and the altar from, from the old chapel in his house. And he readily gave them to them. And uh, they were uh, brought up here and were used by the sisters for many years until they again had a chance to uh, redecorate the church. At that time, uh, some of the pews were placed here. Uh, outside the mission and a few others that are identical to it were put in the choir loft of the uh, mission church. We are now looking at the additional uh, 10 arches which were added in uh, and finished and completed by 1987. Um, this building is built over the ruins of the original uh, part of the convento and as if you will look at the uh, not only the columns uh, of the arches, but also at the floor, you will notice a very sharp rise in the uh, pavement and in the shortness of the arches. And, and that was, uh, had, was accomplished because of the fact that uh, underneath this mission are the original ruins of this end of the building. And according to all the requirements, archeological and uh, sequel laws, we were not able to disturb those ruins, nor would we want to, but they were, uh, uh, buried over, laid with about a, a foot of sand, and which was compacted, so that at a future date, any excavations uh, can, can go back down and see the original floors, the original foundation zone. So literally, this new end of the building floats over the original mission buildings. This raised section four, after the le very last arch of the uh, mission buildings that were standing, uh, before the addition of the new arches. And you will notice the rise in the pavement here. Also, it's at this particular point, you will see where the two buildings were tied together. Uh, there's a steel uh, framing. There are steel beams in here to hold the two beams together. Also, on this particular side, there is also a very large steel beam that uh, also anchors this to the buttress on the, uh, this particular arch. Uh, also, looking at the ceiling, you can tell where the two buildings uh, came together. You will also notice that uh, along the front of the building there are, are a few signs. Uh, above the uh, office door is a sign which is made of metal, which uh, originates from the pastorate of Father Donald, and it uh, announces the parish office. A sign almost identical to it hangs over the, uh, the mission gift shop. This is merely to identify it for, the <coughs> for uh, convenience for our visitors and our par parishioners. There are two signs here. Uh, one 
honoring the uh, Father Junipero the Apostle of California and the founder of the California Mission System. And the second is a, uh, a sign marking the dedication of this new building in 1989. Cardinal Roger, Roger Mahoney was here uh, together with many of the clergy and uh, we had quite a celebration marking the uh, completion of uh, this new building. In the ceiling, uh, as before we arrived here, you probably noticed the lights that hung from the beams. These beams, uh, these lights are not original lights as naturally from the mission period. They were installed as part of our uh, agreements uh, by the Board of Architectural Review, which uh, required us to get a sodium light that had somewhat uh, the antique shape that these lights have. And uh, as it well, at night, they do make quite an attractive picture of the mission. 